um, as far as um, starting possibly your own um, animal program at your particular library. So um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, uh, there's in the downloads area, there is a couple of handouts that you all can download. We'll also have it on our closing slide as well. If you don't get an opportunity to do it now, you all can do it then. Um, of course, at the end, we will have our uh, infamous survey uh, link for you all to click on. And um, once we are done today and you all have done all that, you can click the um, X in the upper right-hand corner, and that will get you out of um, Adobe Connect um, all together. So um, without further ado, we are going to go ahead and get started with our um, Library Link Up Animal Program. And um, our two presenters today, we have Tanya Swan from the Louisville Free Public Library. And then uh, Becky Munoz. Hello, she said, sorry, I'm, I'm talking over her. I need a shush. Um, from the Woodford County Public Library. So, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Your uh, slides are going to change a little bit there. And uh, Ms. Tanya is going to be up first. So thank you all for being with us today. And away we go, hopefully. <laughs> there we go. And uh, as I always say, um, Tanya, you know yourself better than I know you. So whatever kind of introduction you want to do um, is, is fine with us. Well, um, like, my, like you introduced me, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And I've been in library world since 2013. Um, before that, I was an environmental educator at Jefferson Memorial Forest for 13 years. And we did programming, and we utilized animals in our programming. And then before that, I was an educator at the Louisville Zoo. So I'm very passionate about animals and using animals kind of as ambassadors uh, in programming. So when Alicia presented this opportunity, I jumped at it because um, I was just I was very passionate about it. So before I begin, I was wondering if you guys could maybe share a couple of experiences you've had with bringing animals into the library, um, however, whatever form that takes or has taken, um, just so I can kind of get an idea of the background everybody is bringing to this presentation. I brought up my first slide maybe to give people some ideas of things that they may have already have used. I think Ione's uh, typing something in. If anybody else has anything they want to share about uh, the animal program, um, they've done or maybe what you're thinking about um, possibly doing um, at your library. That's perfectly fine too. Oh, they bring puppies and kittens. That's awesome, my own. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, Lifehouse for Animals, is that more of a rescue organization or an animal therapy organization? I'm going ahead too fast. <laughs> so she's typing and Diana Martin's typing something too. So while they're typing, I'm going to go ahead and kind of go through um, some ideas for ways that you can bring animals in. Um, so therapy pet organizations, there are several organizations out there who train their animals, mostly um, dogs, but um, I have seen some organizations that have used cats. Um, one even had a guinea pig. And these are organizations that um, train and certify these animals to be able to come in and interact with people in a safe way. Um, the animals have to go through training so that they don't jump up on people, they don't get scared easy, so there's no um, chance of them biting or um, snapping at somebody. And so that way, um, it's good to go through a certified therapy group 
so that you have those assurances that you don't have to worry. Um, you have to kind of be careful because every once in a while um, we've had people that have brought their dog in wearing a vest saying, I have a therapy dog, can my dog read to children? And neither the person nor the dog have any actual training um, in this area. And so it can kind of set up a bad situation. So you always want to do some background, um, go online and find out. Zoos, um, we have one zoo in Kentucky, the uh, Louisville Zoo, but they do a lot of distance learning. So you can reach out to them. Um, aquariums, we have the Newport Aquarium. If you're in the southern part of the state, um, there's the aquarium in Tennessee that's really good. Um, wildlife rehabilitators, um, not all of them are comfortable speaking in front of groups. Not all of them are comfortable bringing animals out, but you can always check with them and find out. Um, there are some private companies that have started getting into animal programming, um, notably Animal Tail was one um, that we kind of discussed on the listserv. Again, you just want to kind of be careful um, about the private companies and just make sure that they are going through and getting certified um, with either the AZA, that's the American Zoological Association, or um, other groups that do have a certification process. Um, you can also make sure that their um, programmers are certified through the state of Kentucky. Um, we do have an environmental education certification, and it's a whole training program, and it just makes sure that people know, are very knowledgeable about the topics that they're teaching about, and that they have um, signed an agreement saying that they are presenting information in a thoughtful um, manner, and they're not promoting one political agenda over another, that it's um, you know, very neutral. And then library pets, um, see my little picture of a guinea pig? That's one way you can bring them into the library. Not all libraries allow library pets, but we're um, definitely familiar with Dewey, the library cat. And um, one of our libraries, they have guinea pigs, and so it's kind of a fun way to do that. Um, let's see. OK, so the patrons get to see the animals, um, Lifehouse for Animals. So that's a rescue organization. Awesome. Oh, so and then Diane tried to work with the local shelter, but could not get them to cooperate. Um, yeah, sometimes that can be really difficult. It just depends on the staffing of the shelter and their training level as well. Um, some people who work with animals aren't comfortable presenting to people. Um, they're more comfortable with the animal side of things. Um, so. Um, something that you might not have thought about is veterinarians. Um, some veterinarians will come to your location and they will either talk about their career or they will share um, some really wonderful stories. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Dr. Pohl on Animal Planet and he obviously has incredible stories and lots of humor and so veterinarians are um, a really good resource if they are willing to come and share stories at your library branch. Um, farmers, um, they will also share stories. Some will bring animals with them. Rescue organizations, um, those are always good. Um, most rescue organizations have members who will come and do presentations and will bring animals. Um, let's see, petting zoos, they are an option. Most of them are privately run, but as long as you kind of vet them and make sure that they have um, good animal care practices, then um, I think they, they're a really wonderful addition. We had a petting zoo at an event last Saturday at the Southwest Library, and we had um, ponies, llamas, miniature cows. If you've never seen a miniature cow, please look it up on the web. They're adorable. Um, and we had about 900 people attend, so it, it was very popular. Um, then the other thing is stables, um, especially if you live around Woodford County or Shelby County. Um, check into some of the um, places that offer riding lessons, and they might come out, um, maybe bring a horse, maybe not. They could, they could definitely come out and bring saddles, bridles, things like that, and present a talk on horses and the horse industry. Um, I'm just check in to see if there's any other responses. So one of the things that is really important um, 
is making sure that they know their stuff. You want whoever comes in to bring in animals that are happy, healthy, in good condition. You want people to come in that are knowledgeable and in control of themselves and of the animals. Um, and that, that's going to assure that you're going to have a good quality program. So you can look for reviews on their Facebook page, Better Business Bureau, um, the State Fish and Wildlife Agency. I've got a link there uh, if you want to have a rehabilitator come. Rehabilitators will usually specialize, so they'll either have like raptors and songbirds, or they'll specialize in mammals. And uh, you want to just make sure that they are certified by Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. Um, it's a whole very in-depth training program, um, because it is, unless you are certified in the state of Kentucky, it is illegal to rehabilitate animals. It is illegal to have any kind of native wildlife in your home. So you can actually pay a steep fine um, if you don't want to encourage anybody to do anything illegal. And then of course your um, KDLA listservs um, like KYAC, um, I can't think of the other ones, but um, it's wonderful to be able to reach out to your peers and ask them what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, so I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, and then also, because Kentucky does have certified environmental educators, you can go to that website and it lists all the envir certified environmental educators in the state. And most all of them either already provide programs for community groups, or if they don't, they are going to be in touch with and you can use them as a networking um, base to find educators that would be able to come and do programs for your branch. Um, so the next thing, call the provider first to get information, then call them back to reserve your program. The reason I say this is if you go into it and you already have in your mind that I'm just going to call and get information, I'm not going to make any commitments, that really gives you the space to not commit too quickly. So if you call and they sound really awesome and you think, yes, this is the one, you can always call them back and reserve the program. But if you call them and you start to get kind of a feeling like, you know, maybe I'm not quite comfortable with them, then it just gives you permission mentally to hang up and not reserve them. Because their job is going to be to talk you into booking them for a program. So you definitely, um, you don't want to get rushed into anything you don't want to do. One type of program that you have not mentioned that um, when you saw, I saw library pets, I thought it might be referring to that, that we've done a couple of times where you don't have paid performers is we've had a couple of pet shows where the patrons brought their pet. Um, we did have them fill out a form and all the pets had to be up to date on vaccinations before they could come in, but um, we, we did that about two times, and it was a popular program. So they weren't really presenting their pets um, as, as a training thing, but they were, we had independent judges like uh, local priests and some other various people judge the animals on the best tricks, or the furriest pet, or the pet with the longest tail, various topics. And that was one way to have um, animals come in, and um, the owner was the person in charge of the animals all the time. And other people weren't petting or touching their animals, so that kept it a little more safe. Yeah, those have been very popular. Um, and like you said, you just have to really be careful that, you know, people are in control of their animals. Um, and if they have one that doesn't get along with others, that they kind of keep, keep their animal back. But um, no, those tend to be really popular. Um, so when you make your phone call, um, here's some questions that you can ask that will help you determine if they're going to be a good fit. So um, obviously, um, what certifications do they have? What training? Do they have um, is very important. 
if they can um, speak to this um, comfortably and confidently, then you've probably got a really good uh, group. If they get defensive then or ask why you're asking that question, then you're probably, um, that's a warning sign. Um, also asking who will provide and present the program. Um, so is it going to be somebody on their st permanent staff, or is it a volunteer, or is it um, like a seasonal person? Um, generally, um, for most animal programs, um, a volunteer, like especially rescue programs, um, it's all volunteers. And so I wouldn't um, be deterred if they say a volunteer is going to present the program because most volunteers are going to be very experienced, um, especially with dogs and cats. Um, a lot of times the volunteers that work with an organization that go out to do presentations are um, teachers or educators. And so they're volunteering their time and they're using their talents for their organization um, in that manner. But um, it's also good just to kind of have an idea of who's coming. Um, what training have they been given? So if it's a seasonal person that's doing the program, asking, you know, what kind of training um, is good. You know, if they can describe that. Um, when I worked at Jefferson Memorial Forest, our volunteers that went into the community um, and also at the Louisville Zoo, they went through an eight-week training program. So they met once a day, I mean once a day, they met. <laughs> one day a week for eight weeks for several hours on those days and were given very in-depth training so that they felt very comfortable handling the animals, being in control of the animals, and then had a great deal of knowledge to share about the animals. Um, obviously, how long will the program last? So that way what you plan matches what they will present. Um, another thing that um, will tell you a lot about them is you ask what provisions are made for the comfort of the animal. Um, they should be able to describe it, you know, like we only do programs within an hour and a half of our location um, because that will tell you that they don't, you know, put their animals in a trailer in an animal crate for six hours to drive them cross country. Um, if, you know, talking about just, you know, if they want water to be made available to the animals there. Anything that shows that they have thought about the comfort of their animals, that's a good thing. So um, that's something you want to look for. Um, what safety precautions do they take to keep the animals and program participants safe? They should be able to describe those easily and confidently. Um, when I worked with the Kentucky Reptile Zoo in Slade, Kentucky, um, he actually brought venomous snakes to our location, but he was able to describe this is the barrier we need, this is the distance we need from the animals, um, this is the distance I need between myself and the program participants, um, so that he was very knowledgeable about what needed to happen so that everyone had a good experience. Um, and then how do they want the space for the presentation to be set up? And this is just to help you with the planning. Um, most people that bring animals into the library would like to have a table. And actually, that brings me to my next slide. <laughs> um, so you want to provide plenty of space up front for the presenter to move around and to set out their animal crates. Um, unless otherwise directed, provide a table to set small animal containers and biofacts on. Um, biofacts are generally, it's the same thing as artifacts, except biofacts are things that came from an organic um, being, so it could be skulls, it could be feathers, it could be uh, pelts, things like that. Um, and then provide a visual boundary. If you can use like masking tape on the floor to provide that boundary, it makes it easier, especially with young children, for them to know how close they can get because um, I don't know how many of you have done story time with young children, but if you're not careful, you can end up with all of them trying to climb into your lap, which can be kind of a, a dangerous situation if the person also has an animal <laughs> in their lap or holding an animal. Um, you don't want that. Um, so the presenter needs to have 
enough room between themselves and the audience so that they can um, move around, be able to show off the animal so that everybody can see the animal clearly. Um, and also, you know, if the animal were to um, jump out or anything, that they have the ability and space to grab the animal because they're animals. They're unpredictable. Um, so even if you take every safety precaution in the world, animals are going to um, react in ways that you never, never would have expected. Um, so you just want to have those contingencies in place so that everybody has a good time and everybody stays safe. Um, so program setup. So this is taken from kind of when I used to do programs with animals. Um, but obviously check with the presenter and see how you would like, how they would like for you to introduce them. Um, ask if they have their own rules of behavior and expectations. Uh, most that do this all the time will. Um, it's just part of their routine. But um, if they don't, um, I've included some that are a good suggestion. And it is, it's important to provide guidelines for behavior. Um, keep it simple. I would never use more than three rules. More than that, it makes it harder for children to keep in mind. Um, these three basic rules provide something for you and or the presenter to refer back to. Um, so stay seated on your bottom, and you can tell them that if you were a stranger and you were to walk into a room with strange people, and they all jumped up and started running around. How would that make you feel? Um, the animal is the same way, that they would be scared. They might not come out of their crate. Um, so it's important to make sure that our animal friend feels safe. Stay seated on our bottoms. Um, stay quiet so that they will hear everything. Um, that's, you know, just reminding people that the way that they're going to learn something or um, know what's going on is they have to be quiet so that they can hear. Um, also, um, the louder you are, the more you'll frighten the animals. And if the animals are frightened, we can't get them out. Um, the other thing, I actually learned this from a school teacher. She called it, I've heard it called two-finger touch. I've also heard it called science finger touch. Um, but it really helped, um, especially with small ones that want to grab or hold. Um, this kind of gives them a frame of reference. So you just demonstrate two-finger touch, and it also helps them to be gentle when they touch the animal. Um, you want to make sure that you never um, touch an animal anywhere near the face. Um, anything with the mouth and teeth can bite. Um, I tell them, um, kind of relate it to, like if you were at the mall and a stranger were to come up and put their hands on your face, what would you do? And most children say, I would smack them, or I'd push them, or some children even say, I would bite them. And I explain the animals are the same way. They, you know, they don't know you. You're a stranger to them. So if you were to immediately touch them on the face, that startles them. That makes them scared. And that kind of makes it relatable so that they don't think that the animal is just going to bite them to be mean, but they realize, oh, the animal's like me. It would bite because it's scared. Let's see. So there's that. And then the last part is I've just included resources um, and then contact information. Um, these are all places that do distance learning. Um, so they'll either do it uh, via um, closed link TV through the computer. So you can put it on a big projector like the Louisville Zoo and project an animal presentation if they can't drive the distance to your library. Um, but always contact them and check because some places will drive a couple of hours to get to your location. Um, the Salado Nature Center in Frankfurt, they will do outreach. Um, wildlife rehabilitators, so that is just a list of all the rehabilitators in Kentucky. And again, I can't vouch for everybody on that list. All I can do is um, say it's a, they're all certified. They've all been through training with the state. They have to do yearly training, so I know that they're knowledgeable. Um, but I can't vouch for them. Um, Mammoth Cave, they do outreach. Um, they're wonderful. The Liberty Nature Center in Somerset, Kentucky, that started out with Southern, sorry, Southwestern High School. 
um, that was started at the school. They started doing raptor rehab. They built the nature center. And then when the teacher retired, she started the Liberty Nature Center. And um, they have a very good program. Raptor Rehab of Kentucky, they serve Louisville, northern part of Kentucky. Second Chances Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, um, they do have a distance limit. I think it's two hours. They won't go beyond two hours, and they will charge for, um, for distance, for um, mileage. Um, Red Cross Therapy Dogs. They have a unit based at Fort Knox, and they will bring dogs. WAGs, um, they're based in Louisville, but they do um, a lot of surrounding counties, Oldham County, Henry County, Shelby County, some counties in Indiana. Um, Honey Hill Farm covers the entire state. They're the ones that have the many cows, um, and they were very good. They came to our event. Newport Aquarium, they actually will bring sharks, small sharks, and they travel. They have a special um, tank that they transport um, animals, so that's really interesting. The Kentucky Reptile Zoo, um, they are very good. They also do um, venom milking. Um, they will not do it <laughs> as part of the presentation, but if you ever get a chance to go, um, they do demonstrations. He, um, the owner, is one of the people that supplies um, the state of Kentucky and some of the surrounding states with anti-venom. And anti-venom is made from the venomous snakes. So that's kind of cool. Um, so that is it for my presentation. Um, my contact information is there. So if anybody does have any questions, um, I'd be thrilled to answer them or talk over a possible program with you. And if anybody has any questions for next few minutes before Becky starts. Um, I'm available. Otherwise, um, that's it for my presentation. Hi. Thank you so much, Tanya. I really appreciate it. Have some really good information. We got somebody maybe typing uh, something in, so we'll give them um, uh, a couple seconds to see if that um, pops up. If it does, it'll pop up on uh, the next um, room that we're going to open up. So um, we're going to um, move now to Becky from uh, Woodford County. And you all can see your uh, screen change there. And um, you see Becky's pro program um, presentation is going to come up. So um, I'll let her um, introduce um, herself um, and let you all know about um, what they're doing there in Woodford County. So Becky, it's all yours whenever you're ready. All right. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Becky Munoz. I uh, used to be Becky Watson, so in case you met me under my former name. Um, I have been working for the Woodford County Library as a youth services librarian for 20 years. And we've had many, many animal programs. But when Alicia said that she wanted to know about a program specifically for the librarians run, I decided to talk about um, Kids Read the Dogs which we do it almost every month. Uh, we have been doing Kids Read the Dogs since 2008. Uh, originally, we called it Pause to Read. However, people, especially those whose primary language is Spanish, didn't understand what it meant. And even people who speak English, when we would explain that dogs come in for kids to read to them, they would catch on somewhat, but Pause to Read didn't really reveal what the program was, so even though it was a cute name, we changed it. Um, and often when we do describe the program, people are still a little um, querulous about why would you do that, but studies have shown that children gain a lot of confidence reading to dogs. Whereas when reading to other humans makes them nervous. I first heard about this type of program in 2008, I think. And Scott County Public Library in Georgetown had the program. And so myself and one of our reference librarians went to observe. And at that time, Scott County only had one dog coming at a time. And um, many, many, many children waiting to read to them. 
So we decided that we would do it a little differently than that. Um, they are still running the program. This is their image here, um, Books and Best Friends. But my guess is they probably have more than one dog at a time now. The best part for us about the program is that we don't have to find the dogs. Uh, we partner with the organization Love on a Leash, which I checked their website yesterday, and they're a national organization, and they have um, multiple different facets here in Kentucky. And we work with the Lexington organization, but they are willing to drive many different places across the state. And they train the handlers and they train the dogs. And before they can come to a public place like us with children, they have to have so many hours of training. So the, um, we haven't had any issues with any of the dogs. Um, but we do because just in case we might, and this was an idea that we also got from Scott County, we do have the parents sign a permission form that the child can read to the dog before we send the child to a dog. Um, the handler, of course, is also there with the dog, but um, we've never had any dog act in an aggressive way towards another child at the program. The dog that's in this picture here, Griff, only has three legs, so he um, he's a therapy dog and he helps children with disabilities, but he also is a disabled dog. Um, mm -hmm. The dogs have to have, like I said, so many hours before they work with children at all, and then they have to keep getting, like us, so many hours of training every year. And so when you read it, it says we only get certified or nearly certified canines. So the ne nearly certified ones are at the end of their training period. Um, the humans that we have come have also been trained in how to work with children. and. I was trying to see on the website if it said they were background checked, but I'm not sure that they are. But I trust that Love and Alicia wouldn't be sending us people that were unsafe to be around children. But the part that is the most amazing about these dogs, as opposed to you know most pets, is we've had up to eight dogs in our large room, and the dogs don't react to each other. They stay in their area, sitting on the floor or sitting on their rug, and don't try to sniff the other dogs or bark at the other dogs. Or So that really, really, really makes a difference in dealing with children who might be afraid of dogs, that the dogs aren't barking and the dogs aren't trying to play with each other while they're at the program. And it does come up, and Tanya uh, also alluded to it a little bit, Many people volunteer to bring their own dogs, but we don't allow them to because um, we don't know their dogs, the dogs haven't been trained, and also we don't know the people. So um, not every person that really likes their dog is necessarily going to be good with kids. So that's why part of why having this organization that say, well, if you want to do this, you have to go through them, gives us a nice barrier by, from having random people come to the program. Um, and how we run it is children take turns reading to the dogs. Uh, I start the program by reading a book to the whole group that allows any stragglers to get in there on time. And then we have written down the names of all the children. And um, say we have five dogs, the first five children who signed up for the program will go to those five dogs. And the others will be working on an art project while they're waiting their turn. And so this is an example of one of the art projects. But by giving the children something to do, again, um, when I first observed it, the children were just sitting and waiting and watching the child who was reading to the dog, which probably made the, that child who was reading more nervous. So by distracting the children by having art, um, it uh, allows everyone to be more comfortable and the people that are waiting to not have to uh, feel so anxious. Most of the time, the children actually get to read to three or four of the dogs because we do um, bring in the books, and I only bring in pretty short books for them to read. Um, the the lady in this picture, the one in the middle, um, Lisa, she's the coordinator for Love on the Leash, so she calls the dog owners 
and reminds them this is coming up and gets commitment from them. And so I just remind Lisa that it's coming up, and she gets all the dog handlers. And I would say that in your own community, you probably whoever works with Love and Leash would do that same thing for you. Um, since they're volunteering their time, um, we do try to thank them by not asking them to come in July, August, or December, because uh, we always do it on Saturdays. And Saturdays in those months are often very busy or people are out of town. We do it the second Saturday of the month. Um, the outcomes of, of Kids Read the Dogs is uh, I have seen it. Children grow more confident as readers by coming and reading to the dogs. And many of the parents have noted that, too, that their child was um, more readily willing to try to read harder words if there was a dog listening than otherwise. And we have had several patrons who were afraid of dogs start coming to this program. And just by being around the dogs and sitting near them and not having to touch them and the dogs being trained not to touch the child, they eventually got over their fear of dogs. Um, and the therapy dog owners like it, too, because it, the library is very organized in how we run this program. The other dogs that come are also trained and uh, very calm, and they know what to expect. So it, it's good for them, as well as for us, to have a pattern how we run each and every one of the programs. And the dog owners like to interact with the children as well. And the children are very happy to see the dogs, so everyone has a good time. And you can see this dog was very, very relaxed as he was being read to. Um, we've had dozens and dozens of dogs participate over the years. And some of, in fact, since we've been doing it for 11 years, a few of the dogs have died. But new dogs have come along um, since and have gotten trained. And some of the kids that started with it are now grown-ups. Um, and there's been a few people who came in and they just really couldn't get over their uncomfortableness with dogs, and so they only came once. But And there's a few dogs who didn't like having to sit in a room full of other dogs, so they didn't. their owners didn't bring them back. But those are the, the exceptions. Most of the dogs and most of the children have really enjoyed it. And it doesn't cost us anything other than some library time. I usually have two staff people running. I'm there, and I have a, a part-time person also keeping track of who's read to which dog. And um, that way we have, in case anything were to happen, a, a staff member to deal with the problem and another one to continue the program. Um, and that's mainly what it costs us is just library staff time. Um, we have, we average about, because we count all the people that come for the program, so that's the parent and the child and the dog handlers. About 35 people is a pretty average number for kids read the dogs. And I don't see us stopping it unless the dog handlers decide they don't want to do it anymore. Um, if we had, if I had to find the dogs each month, then it would be a much, much more difficult program to run because, um, you know, I don't have a connection to a therapy to therapy dog, so we'd have to find a new way to do it. But right now, with having that dog, uh, the, the therapy dog coordinator getting the dogs every month, um, my job is to get the children interested. And children, and once they find out what it is, they're usually pretty interested. Yes, some of the children do have um, their favorite dogs that they like to read to. Um, but how we do it is that since we have a list, um, they have to take turns. So they're not allowed to keep going back to the same dog so that every child gets a chance to read to the different dogs. If there's not um, another, dog, another child waiting for that dog, then they can go back. And yes, yeah, some of the children will want to read to the that dog, say Princess is one of the dogs, um, they'll want to read to Princess each time she's there. 
but they're very good, like I said, between the art project and then they like to read different books and just seeing that, okay, it's fair and I'm going to get my turn. The children are usually pretty good about um, taking turns and waiting until it's their turn to read to a dog again. The, um, if the child really, really doesn't want to do that, they don't have to stay the, at the program for the whole hour. And we've had a few impatient children. They read to the dog they want to, and then they leave. And that's not our ideal, but if that's how they want to handle it, that's fine. They just read one book at a time. Uh, yes, they do. Um, and if the child has brought a picture book, I mean a chapter book in with them, I give a, a reminder before we set them free to go start reading the dogs that if you bring a longer book that you're going to be able to read some of the book. You won't be able to read the whole book to the dog because other people will be waiting for their turn. Okay. Thank you. We also do other animal programs. We've had many of the other organizations. We're having a miniature horse brought tomorrow. Um, and it'll be the miniature horse's first time coming to the library, so we'll see if hopefully that'll go well. But yeah. um, Kids Read the Dog is, is the only program that we have on a monthly basis with live animals. And we actually had our board, um, they wrote a policy because we had a patron complain about animals in the library saying that pets are not allowed in the library, but animals are allowed here for special programs. And so that, um, and of course we advertise when these programs are going to be so that anyone who has an issue with animals, whether it's allergies or they just don't like animals being in the library, they'll know when they are and having that board policy covers us. That's a good, that's good, yeah. I was wondering, does anybody that's participating in this, do they have any library pets like we do at the St. Matthew's Library with the guinea pigs or, or do we the library cat? I'm always curious about that. Um, this is, Alicia, I don't think any of the, um, our participants today do, but I know um, Madison County, I think, has a bearded lizard and a cat. I can't remember if they're at the same location. I'm pretty sure the bearded lizard, or if I'm getting that lizard name correct, is at the Berea um, location. And then I want to say Powell County has a library cat by the name of Binks. Um, <laughs> yeah, those are the only two locations I can recall off the top of my head that do have a library pet um, that's there most of the you know, the day, I think they go, the cat, the one cat goes home at Powell County, goes home with somebody um, at night. And then if someone comes in and, you know, they don't particularly like cats or allergic, they will put the cat, I think they have, you know, a room, like a, in the staff area in the back, they will put that, the cat up upon um, request from a patron. But I don't know what policies they have in place, but, yeah, like, like, Becky said, that's a good policy to have and something from your board, you know, letting everybody know um, the library's stance on um, animals in the library. Right. We and Becky, I can't remember. Had, go ahead. We had Madagascar hissing cockroaches, like many libraries did during the summer when it was catch the reading bug. Yeah. But otherwise. <laughs> We haven't had pets because, unfortunately, before I was here, the library had, had some pets that uh, patrons were unkind to. So. Oh, yeah. whoa! Not good. But you do have to take that into consideration as well, too. Well, no. Does anybody have any other questions? Like Diana's trying to say maybe type something. Yeah, Becky, I didn't know if you had another slide or not. I didn't know if oh, you. Oh, I do. I do have one more. Okay. I forgot. 
Uh, it's just my inf contact information and the little girl with the red hair right there. That's me. I was wondering. The, <laughs> the, the puppy was my first dog, Buttons. So I go back a long way with dogs. Here you go. <laughs> um, now, Becky, I don't, don't want to put you on the spot, so if you're not comfortable talking about it. Um, I don't know if you want to say something about your old National Geographic program. Well, yesterday we did an animal program, but we didn't have any animals in the building. But it went really well. We actually got this idea from Jefferson County. Um, they, National Ge Geographic has a website called Live Safari where if you register as a class, so your library can be a class, you um, have a, a time. You have to register for a time. And then the National Geographic guides in Kenya and South Africa will drive around on their parks and show you the animals that they can find in your time slot. And then they'll answer live questions from the uh, patrons. So Bookie, who's the assistant children's services librarian, was connecting through Skype and typing in with her phone <coughs> questions yeah. from the patrons. Okay. And it went really well. Um, the only problem with that is they like people to register for that class the month of the program, and usually we we have to plan our programs months ahead. So that took a while to get that negotiated. But it was a great program, and it was free. I was wondering if it cost you all anything. No, it didn't. We just had to have the technology to do it, and so we used a television as far as what we used for our screen. Okay. Now, was that something I know is probably um, more geared like toward the children's program? Could you see that as, I guess, working as like a family program as well? Yes, I could. Um, we okay. had, of course, adults. And we had all ages yesterday. We had from two to um, probably tween age children and their parents. Okay. I like that idea, like bringing animals in without bringing them in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we saw like live wild elephants and hippopotamuses and rabbits, which I didn't know they had in South Africa, and an owl and um, springboks. And so it was, you know, where they went along their route, they stopped to show us the wild animals that were there. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. That's well, called National Geographic Live Safari? Yes. OK. And, um, Katie, Katie, Kate Irwin at um, Jessamine County was the originator of starting that in libraries here. And they did a presentation about it at, at um, the summer reading conference in the fall. So they have a lot of information on it. Thank you, Becky. At Jessamine County Library, if you want to contact her. I forgot to say where Kate is. She's at the Jessamine County Library. All right. And um, yeah, if y'all don't remember that, we can probably um, get a hold of Krista King Oaks, and she can give us that contact information um, as well. But I know Jessamyn County is really good about working with everybody, so they won't mind if anybody gives them a call. <laughs> OK, did anybody out there have any other questions um, for, for Becky or Tanya before we um, close out our animal programs library link up? Um, if you all do, go ahead and uh, chat those in. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, Becky and Tanya, if, if y'all are um, done, um, I will go ahead and flip it over to closing. But if y'all have anything else y'all want to say, you know, feel free. Well, live animal okay. programs are the number one draw, um, especially if they're going to have snakes. But <laughs> any program that we have that has got live animals is probably going to overfill our capacity, which is a good reason to keep safety in mind, but also is um, a way to draw people to the library. And it's a good reason besides feeling like, I mean, I've learned from these 
the live animal programs. And I think it's very important to teach the public about animals. For example, um, the raptor rehabilitators have come several times and taught people that red-tailed hawks are good for the environment, not something that they should shoot. So, um, and also the snake programs have taught people to be kind to snakes. So I think that they do the animals some good as well as the people that learn. Yeah, that's something I forgot to mention, but it was in my slide. That was part of the piece about making sure people have access to the exits, because sometimes people will have a very um, excitable response to an animal, um, if it's a rat or if it's a snake. And so it's always good to provide people a way to just ex quietly exit, um, so that way they don't have to stay in the room if it's something that they're very scared of. Yeah, that's very true. And one thing I don't, I'd for, to forget totally to think about, but yeah, there, there are people that, you know, like I said, are extremely afraid of certain animals. And yeah, they would need a, a way to be able to get out of the room quickly. All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to um, move to our closing uh, slide here and um, to just to wrap things up. Um, if you all need to, y'all are welcome to download the handout for um, both Tanya and Becky's um, presentation. You just want to click on the um, file and then click on download file and the window will open up. It might be um, behind your Adobe Connect screen, but you can download the file directly um, to your computer. If you don't have time to do it now, you can always come back into this room. They will still uh, be here for about another month and uh, go ahead and uh, download those. And um, when you uh, get a chance again, you can come back in the room if for about for the next 30 days and do this as well. Um, but there in the uh, survey link box, um, if you all click on the browse too, uh, we'd love for you all to um, just take a few seconds and uh, like I said, uh, respond to our survey. Just lets us know um, what you like, what you didn't like. Um, you know, if we're um, providing uh, webinars and things that um, help you all um, do your your job at the library. So um, that is it for um, for us today. If you all definitely have any more questions um, for um, Becky and Tanya, feel free to hang around. I uh, appreciate you all joining us today. And want to say a huge thank you to Tanya and Becky for being able to um, present. People that are willing to present make these things um, possible. So we really appreciate y'all taking your time um, to do this and um, working with other uh, Kentucky Public Libraries to hopefully bring in some, some good animal programs um, to their location. So um, like I said, we'll hang around a little bit, but thank you all very much. Everybody have a good Thursday and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much for your help, Alicia. Oh, you're both welcome. Thank you all for doing this. We really appreciate it. And when uh, everybody's um, ready to exit, just click the X in the upper right-hand corner. And Becky and Tanya, whenever you all are ready, y'all can do that. You can hang up on me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you all again so much. Y'all have a good rest of the day. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>